I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, folks. This episode is with actress Christina Elizabeth Smith. In this episode, we talk about how she fell in love with tap dancing and thus the stage, and we talk about her family-instilled work ethic. She also touches on the curriculum difference between Improv Olympic, Upright Citizens Brigade, and the Groundlings. Plus, she tells the story of how she came to work with Jimmy Kimmel Live and Cousin Sal. And of course, we talk about what it's like to work with such great iconic actors as Alan Ruck and Scott Bakula, as well as some of her past and upcoming projects. Enjoy, guys. This is actress Christina Elizabeth Smith. Welcome to the show, Christina Elizabeth Smith. How are you doing today? <laughs> I am great. Thank you. How are you? I am freezing. Oh, where are you that you're freezing? I'm in Los Angeles. No, I'm in San Antonio. And for some reason, it's cold here. Weird. Well, it's not cold here. I'm in New Orleans and it's not even a little bit cold. It's not even trying to be cold. Seriously? Yeah. No, that it's not even suggesting it. Well, that's not fair because you're only about Five hours away from me, if that. Yeah, well, we're down here, though, so it's, it's holding on to the summer. Weird. So this past Sunday, my wife and I went to, um, there's a bunch of wineries up here about an hour from me in the Texas Hill Country, and we went on Sunday, and we had to bring a cooler to put all of our wine in because it was 97 degrees outside, and then Monday, the high was like 44. Uh, he- that reminds me a lot of Nashville, That's a, because that's where I was born and raised, and Nashville's like that. One day we'll be 80, and the next day we'll be 50. It's insane. That's not typical for down here, and the whole week is, is going to be like that and raining. So, woohoo! Oh, lovely. That's okay. You can It can feel like fall, and you can start to decorate for fall and make cookies. Ooh, cookies! That's what I'll do. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm actually going to hang up right now and just start making cookies. Okay, bye! Really fun. Bye. Thank you for calling in. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Christina Elizabeth Smith. Just kidding. I won't do that anymore. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I think you just said you were, uh, I guess, born and raised in Nashville? Yeah, born and raised. Now, I have interviewed a lot of people from Nashville for some reason. I think it's um, a popular place now. It was not popular to grow up there because it wasn't hip yet. Like, it was just known for country music, and, you know, country music was still not cool. But in the last, I would say, 10 years, 10 to 12 years, it's become so hip, and so many people have flooded into Nashville. So it makes sense there's so many creatives out there now. Yes. I blame Miley Cyrus. I think that's safe to do. You can just blame her. Her whole family. How about that? We'll just blame her whole family. Oh, geez. Yeah, okay. I'm fine with that. (laughs) Tell me about growing up in a sleepy Nashville. Well, it's funny. I always say Nashville, but I actually grew up in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is like 45 minutes outside of Nashville. So you're a liar. Yeah, I'm a liar. I just want everyone to know that about me, just up front. All right. Um, Well, here's why that's funny. Remember I said I was in San Antonio? uh Uh-huh. You lied to? I'm about 30 minutes outside of San Antonio. (laughs) Yeah. Well, because the whole if you say I'm from Clarksville, Tennessee, they're like, I don't, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, yeah, it's like 45 minutes. I'm like, I'm just going to say Nashville because then I don't have to talk less. It's not a big thing. So it gives them sort of like a place to put it in their brain. No one knows where Clarksville is unless you're from Clarksville. So I've always said Nashville. Or you're a fan of that Monkees song, Last Train to Clarksville. Oh, yeah. We had it play like all through. I think we did like some assembly and like sang it in fifth grade or something. Yeah, that that song was uh, drilled into our brain pretty good because they're like, oh, my gosh, there's a song about our town. <laughs> so we knew it pretty well growing up. Sweet. Hit it. I'm not going to sing that song. Is that what you're asking? Because I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Oh, well, it was well, worth I'm the an shot. actor, not a singer. <laughs> okay, so no, 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 no. so before you're an actor, well, let's talk about you being 
a tap dancer. How did that happen? Oh, that's a funny thing. Yeah, well, I was a competitive dancer from like the age of, um, I started dancing at the YMCA, like the lo- local YMCA, just because my mom wanted to kind of get rid of me sometimes. <laughs> She's like, you need to go away sometimes. <laughs> so I started taking ballet at the YMCA and then I just felt so in love with it. And then they canceled the program and I got really sad. And so my mom found another studio in the town and I just got really obsessed with dance immediately. And so I was a hardcore dancer, competitive, and in it from probably the age of like 9, 10 to, you know, 16, 17, because I think you kind of age out of competition at that point. So that was kind of my entire introduction into performance. I didn't know if I was going to be a professional dancer, but it's something having to do with the stage and performance was always where my life was going to go. And I knew that from a really young age. Tap, we got lucky enough to have this amazing woman who came in from Chicago. She happened to move there. I think her husband got a job in Clarksville. And she was one of those magic teachers. You just get around and she can completely change the game. And she made me fall in love with Gene Kelly and would watch every Gene Kelly movie that ever happened. And so I was already in love with Tap, but she took it to a whole other level. And she um, coached us to a place where we, you know, went to nationals and won nationals. And it was just, she just was one of those teachers you never forget because they make you fall in love with something you're already in love with even more. So I got really lucky with the people that I found and really lucky with parents that saw that love in me and just always supported it. Very cool. You sound like a young Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Gene Kelly has... I think he has the distinction of being in like the very first live action movie that also had animated characters. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. He was in a movie, I think it was called Ships Ahoy, where him and a young Frank Sinatra are dancing and then along comes Tom and Jerry. And so I think either it's just Gene or it's Gene and Frank, but they're dancing with Tom and Jerry. Oh, man, I got to find that. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm a huge Frank fan. That's that's the only reason I know that. Yeah. You're tap dancing your little heart out, and you win the U.S. National Championship, right? Yes, we did. Well, first we had to qualify. You qualify at regionals, and then you go to um, nationals with that same qualifying dance. And we went to nationals, and it was kind of, There was always a studio above. There was always a studio that had more money and they had, they could bring in guest teachers from LA and we were never that studio. We were a tiny studio in Clarksville, Tennessee. And we just had this one really amazing lady that worked with most of our, you know, choreography and, but we had really hungry students. And I think that we were never expecting to win nationals. We just went in loving this particular number. We actually danced to singing in the rain. That was our, we just loved it. We loved everything about it. And I guess that translated and we won and it was, and we also won top scores overall. So I think it was one of those things of like, we didn't go in expecting that, but it was really exciting. It kind of felt like the underdogs won. You don't have to tell me. I've seen Bring It On and Step It Up or whatever it's called. (laughs) So we weren't fighting with anybody. We didn't like, we were lucky. We, it wasn't like, I don't know. I got lucky. There wasn't a lot of cattiness. So we weren't fighting. So that, I got lucky for that. That's hilarious. Or maybe they were, and I, maybe they were, and I was just too naive to know. I was sitting in the corner going over routines. I don't know. You know what? That's pretty funny. That's that's like uh, one of the ways you can just hardcore diss somebody is when you find out. You know, uh, oh, let, let's just say that uh, you find out that I'm furious with you, right? Like I'm I'm mad. I want to fight you, and the. The biggest slap in the face is for you to not even know who I am. <laughs> and so... Yeah. Oh, what? What's happening? You're like, yeah. who? They're what? And so I think everybody else at that competition wanted to beat you guys to death. And y'all were just like, who? What's happening? Who are those people? Exactly. And we had like, we had homemade costumes. You know, it was just, we were kind of head in the clouds and just loved what we were doing. That sounds super awesome. Pretty fun. It's a pretty fun way to grow up, that's for sure. So at some point, you you figure out that there's not really a huge, I guess, career path for tap dancing or competitive dancing. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so you decided that you were going to get into acting. So tell me what drew you to acting. I think there were a lot of different elements that kind of came into play. Again, I always knew it was going to be some kind of performance. When I was 16, I had that same really amazing teacher suggest that I move to Chicago and, you know, pursue tap more. And my mom was like, absolutely not. You're 16. That's great. And that kind of opened my eyes a little to, okay, I have to navigate if I want to, you know, move to Chicago, New York, or L.A. What does that look like? And then I got this weird feeling when I got started to get older, probably 16, 17, where dancing fulfilled a certain thing inside of me that I wanted to say, but I needed more. It's almost that idea of, like, I needed to say something more. And I think that is when my sister was actually in college at the time, and she was taking a bunch of theater courses, so I stole all of her books. So I was like, well, I will just read these books and see what that's about. Because, again, it related to performance. So I'm like, maybe this will help my dancing, or maybe I'll learn something. And so I started reading a lot of, like, Uta Hagen books, and I was like, what is this thing she's talking about? <laughs> and I think I just found my answer really young. I found that this is a way, I don't think you lose the part of you that's a dancer. I think that informs acting. And so it was a way to take dancing and then be able to say more by having a script and having these beautiful words that you could bring to life. So I just became then obsessed with learning as much as I could. I didn't really have anywhere to train, but I just read as many books as I could get my hands on. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to LA. Like, I know this plan. Now I'll just get a billion jobs and save money to move to LA. Well, I think that you had mentioned that you think that the performance aspect sort of informed your acting, but I also want to point out that probably all of your competitiveness and all the competitions sort of informed what acting mostly is, which is, you know, fighting each other for the same job. Right. I think that's, that's uh, really dead on. I think it's, it also builds this sort of resilience of, like, I have something to say, I'm just going to focus on the craft. It, it, it gives a sort of, uh, which I think all sports, all athletes have that feeling where they, they get a sort of um, idea of discipline and um, study and wanting to absorb everything it is about being good at what you do. And through that, being resilient enough to keep doing it, no matter how, how many times you're rejected or, you know, you don't win the competition. And also seeing from the dance perspective that it ultimately isn't competition, because I'll only stand by that. We're not really ever competing with anybody else. We're just competing with the best version of ourselves. And so dance really informs that and it's helped me throughout my entire acting career. That sounds awesome. So you have been on stage, in film, and on TV. Do you have a, any one of those that you prefer? It's a, it's a hard one. There's such different beats. There is something about being on stage that, again, it's a you know, throw back back to those dancing days of like, there's nothing, there, there's nothing that feels like being on a stage. There's also a level of autonomy that you have on stage because yes, you rehearse, but at the end of the day, when that show is up and you're out there, whatever happens, happens. It's not like in post, they're going to change the edit. And then they're like, and then you watch it and you're like, oh, that's the edit they chose. And they edit it like this. And that's, that feels like a different story than what I was telling, you know? So there's a level of, I don't want to say control because that seems like it has a negative connotation, but there is something magic that happens with theater in that way. And to have the immediate response right in front of you, you get to sort of tell these people a story and, and feel that energy in the room. But I think the reach of television and film is so much larger. You know, we can reach a larger audience and tell stories that I, I feel like ultimately people need to see and hear. So that's the appeal that I've always had about film. And there's a level of intimacy in TV and film that you can't really get on the stage, you know, because you have tighter shots and so people can see what you're thinking just behind your eyes. Yeah, I guess, you know, you don't really have to play to the back of the room on TV and film. Right. So well, if you did, it would, you know, so <laughs> probably be a little too much if you did. So, yeah, you see, I think a little more of your soul can come through in the intimacy of TV and film. Yeah, I think if you try to play to the back of the room in a film, then uh, you end up with 
Tommy Wiseau's The Room or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Tell me about how you got into commercials and music videos and stuff in Tennessee. How did you get started in that? That involved just through me doing, I started doing some research. I was like, what is going on in this town, if anything? And I found the agents that existed in, in Nashville at the time. So I just had a friend of mine. I was doing a little bit of like photography already, like kind of modeling-ish. I don't like to say modeling, but it was, you know, local modeling because that's the thing. And I met a friend and then got headshots and I was like, okay, I know what this is. So I'll just send this with a little experience. I had a little bit of um, theater experience I had done and I'll just send this to all the agents. And then eventually got a meeting with one and she, her name, her name was Sharon. She was amazing. She, I still talk to her sometimes. She was so sweet. And she just started to submit me to things and I would go on auditions and figure out what all of that was about. And uh, I just started booking a lot of music videos. Because Nashville at the time didn't really have much TV. It was was very music video heavy. So I got one large music video, and that kind of opened a bunch of doors. But then you hit that ceiling really quickly. You hit that ceiling of like, well, we can't use this one video girl in in every single artist video. So, you know, I I got, I booked one, and it was probably my 15th music video I'd done in like a year or maybe a year and a half, something crazy. And I booked it, and then the label rejected me. They're like, we can't use her anymore. And then that was sort of my message, that it was time to move on and and really get out to a bigger market, because I'm not just going to do music videos forever, even though, we're, even though they were so fun, and I still have such a large group of friends that I met on all of those shoots. And then there were a couple sprinkled in commercials here and there, but they were very few and far between. And those were usually the same casting directors that were doing the music videos were also doing the commercials. So just a tiny, tiny market at the time. Gotcha. Now, were you dancing or just acting or both in all these music videos? I was just acting. These were strictly acting. I had kind of taken a little bit of a break from dancing, probably at the age of, I want to say 18, I stepped away from dancing for a while. I was always athletic. I was always doing some sort of movement, but I sort of stepped away from dance because I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to still feed that and, you know, pursue acting. So I kind of stepped away from dance and went really strong into acting. So all of those, again, were acting gigs, not dancing. Gotcha. So when did you decide to move to California to to further your acting, I guess, marketability? I decided that fairly early on. Probably I was solid on it by the age of probably 18, I want to say. And then it was just a matter of like, well, I don't know anything about this. And it was logistics. I'm like, well, I have to have enough money. So I just started working a lot of side jobs. I got a restaurant job. I was like lifeguarding at the time. I had bunch of side jobs and I was like I'm just gonna bankroll as much possible money as I can I mean now when I think back to it I'm like I didn't know anything about LA but I knew it was gonna cost money (laughs) so I did that until the age of like 21 22 and then I just packed up my Honda Civic and finally left but that was always the goal I was very um and I think it was funny talking to people they were like yeah okay you're gonna move to LA okay and I, I think people thought that it was a phase or that I would, that it would fade away, but it was just, I was, you know, really bullheaded about that was what was going to happen. And I was going to find a way to get out there and, and eventually did after years of working and saving up money. So did that plan work for you? And by that, I mean, when you finally got to LA, did you like shit yourself and go, Oh no, I don't have enough money. Or did you, had you built up a pretty decent cushion where you didn't have to really freak out? <laughs> My mom helped me move out there. And I remember when we first got out there, I had this apartment on Larchmont for people that know L.A., which is this cute little quiet, sleepy street. And I had rented the place, which I'll never do this now. I rented the place sight unseen. Like, I didn't know anything about L.A., any neighborhoods. And I had a friend that was randomly moving back to Clarksville the same time I was moving out to L.A. And she's like, just take over my apartment. And being so young and so excited, I was like, okay. Uh, and I get there and it's, it's definitely a slumlord, 
But I was so excited about being in L.A. that it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Like, my mom was super sad about it. I had to, like, choke down all her words. But she's like, I can't believe I'm going to leave you in this place. But I didn't care. I was like, I knew I was where I was supposed to be finally. And as far as money, I had a tiny cushion of money. But I still, you know, slept on an air mattress for probably nine months to a year. And... You know, I had a job that I just went down the stairs of my apartment and walked, I think, 20 steps. I think I used to count the steps. I would work at this restaurant. It was like 20 steps down. And I just always knew that I wasn't going to have a ton of money. But I came from a family that just were workers, so we know how to work. And as long as I know how to work, I will always find the way to pay my bills. So I just made it work. And it it didn't matter because I knew I was in the place that I was supposed to be. So there was relief of like now I don't have to up and move myself I'm here I think that coming from a family of workers is pretty important no matter what job or career you decide to pursue because as one of life's most basic fundamental rules if you can't work or you don't want to work or you don't see the point or the value in it you're not going anywhere ever. So good mm-hmm. on your whole family for instilling that into a young Christina. Yeah, they were they were such a blessing throughout the entire process. But that was always the feeling of like, you can have anything that you want, but you're going to have to work. But it creates a kind of feeling of security in me that no matter what happens, no matter what it comes down to, if I swallow my ego and I'm willing to go out and do whatever it takes, you know, work-wise, get a job wherever I need to, to pay the bills, to be able to do what I love. And uh, I always knew I had that in my back pocket, the ability to just work a job and swallow my ego and know that that would facilitate me being being able to be an artist, which is always going to be my main goal. How hard was it to find an agent once you got to L.A.? Yeah, it took years. And of course, I went through the phases of finding Sammy agents and then the creepy agents and then having meetings that just, I went through all of it. You know, you run the gamut of things you're going to run into Hollywood and people taking advantage of young artists coming in. But luckily I had, because I was working at a restaurant immediately, I had friends there that were working actors already. Like one really nice friend of mine was already doing a lot of commercials and he kind of introduced me into like the improv comedy world. And through doing all of that, I met a lot of incredible people and learned a lot about comedy, which is what they want for commercials out there. And then eventually through like graduating Improv Olympic and having that under my belt, I was able to find a really amazing commercial agent that I'm still with in L.A. I've been with her for years and years now. So that was, again, through the hard work of being like, well, I'm going to have a skill. I'm going to have something to offer. Because that was the main goal moving out there, too. Like, yes, I want the agents, but I don't want to get in the doors before I'm ready. I want to know that I'm an actor with something to offer. And the cool thing about L.A. is, like, there's such an abundance of classes and study, and and you just have to find, you know, which direction you want to go with that. Now, you did mention Improv Olympics. And I believe you also went to the Groundlings and the Upright Citizens Brigade, right? Yeah, I tend to, I wanted to cover all my bases. They're all very different beasts. In Olympic was the one I did their entire program. Groundlings I did half their program. Same with UCD, half their program. I wanted to have the feeling of understanding the tones of these different schools and how they operate. And it was years of studying improv comedy, and I just loved it. It's a, it's a great community. I have so many friends still from the improv comedy world, and it was kind of a way of, of finding a home away from home. So I loved all of them for completely different reasons because they're so they're so different. I wanted to, you know, it's again the accomplishment feeling of like I want to feel like you know, I'm not just stuck to one, like not just one owns me. I want to be able to, you know, conquer them all in my way. And what does that look like? Yeah. To be able to understand the different facets of the different styles of improv. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the things you learned at all those three places doing improv have helped you in other aspects of your life? I do think so. I think improv forces you to be very present, forces you to listen. It forces you to just be more aware and I think that and be brave like you have to be very brave I think comedians are so incredibly brave 
And it also really teaches you how to fail in the right way. So you get up and you do an improv show and it doesn't work. And the value of learning that through failure, you're going to grow. Like you're not, you're not going to be able to, you know, sort of test those limits until you test the limits and see where the walls are and, and learn from that. So it really teaches you how to fail and the benefits of failing in art. And I think that that has been an incredibly important lesson for me. And so I get excited about that growth in learning that instead of like, you you know, you go up and you do something and it doesn't work or you, you drop a line in an audition and you leave and you beat yourself up, like that is not going to get you anywhere. Instead of like leaving and being like assessing it, like yeah, I'm going to assess it, like I did A, B, and C and it resulted in this. Next time I want it to be this result. How can I bridge the gap? How can I bring those two things together? I think that that's a growth mindset. So it really taught me that. Just like fail, who cares? No one's going to die. Yeah, I like that. Sharks don't swim backward. <laughs> yeah. Now let's talk about let's talk about your career and some of the work you've done. Cool. Mm-hmm. Tell me how you got into daytime television. I'm trying to think of my first credit, which I think was Days of Our Lives, and that was back when the workshops were still not a bad word. <laughs> so workshops are essentially, if for people that don't know, when you go in. You pay a nominal fee to go in with a casting director, and they sort of teach a class, and then you do a reading for them. And I gained a lot of my relationships with casting directors that way. You know, I I love being face-to-face with the creators, the casting directors, the directors. So getting in front of their faces and, and doing the work and then working with them on the material, that's how I gained a lot of my relationships. And then they would call me in directly. They're like, oh, I remember this girl from this workshop. I'm going to call her in directly. She does this thing that I really like. And that was how I ended up getting a lot of the first credits that I got I got by myself, just through relationships I had built in workshops. And so how long into your uh, California acting career? I know you said it was a few years, but how many... If you had to guess, how many credits would you say you had before you got a real legitimate agent? Before I got with my agent that I adore out in L.A., I had already done Grey's Anatomy. So that was, I think, 2015 when I did that. I got Grey's Anatomy on my own. I had an agent that I was somewhat unhappy with. I wasn't really getting any auditions, but I still had her negotiate the contract. And as far as negotiating a contract, she was amazing. And definitely did her job. It was just didn't have the momentum to get me in the doors, which is what you really want from your agent to be able to get you in the doors. It's like, I'll do the rest of the work. Just get me in there. So it was after Grey's Anatomy that I had, I was like, okay, now I have a little more leverage. I'm going to take this and shove it in front of as many people's faces as I can and just say, hey, I'm a working actor. You know, I have something behind me. And uh, that was when, you know, that was 2015, 2016. So I moved to L.A. in 2007. So that's a lot of years trying to do the agent dance. Wow, that is a lot of years. That's not to say I wasn't represented, but getting somebody legitimate that you're like, yes, now I'm backed by somebody that can get me indoors that I'm very happy with. It it took me that long. How come you didn't give up? There's no option for me to give up. This is what I'm supposed to do. And... You know, again, it was the influence of my family and the support of my family. I come from a very strong family. It just was never the option. Why go out there and, and give it seven years and give up? I'm, uh, there was a lot of people that I would pull from. I remember, you know, and I, I don't want to say this wrong, but I think it was Jeremy Renner was interviewed on some late night talk show. And this was after Hurt Locker, I think. And they asked him, like, how does it feel to be a breakout star? And his only response, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but his only response was like, I've been doing this for 25 years. So the idea that that's what it takes, it's the long game. And when you have the backing of training and you have the backing of like, I know I have something to say. I just have to be in the right place at the right time around the right people. And they're going to let me tell the story. So I think the combination of having inspirations from books and mentors and really cool people that never gave up and also the training that made me feel like I have something to give and something to say in this world and I'm never going to stop. Like Everybody can tell me no, but I'm never going to stop. Nice. I think that goes back mm-hmm. to uh, to that work ethic that you uh, sort of raised in. 
Nicely done. I definitely. Yeah. Thank you. What did you do on the Jimmy Kimmel live show? Oh, I love them. I have done so much with the Jimmy Kimmel family. Um, I met them the funniest way. I met them on a plane going to South by Southwest. I met the Kimmel guys. It was um, one of the writers and cousin Sal. Like, we just met, and I didn't know who they were at the time, and they just started talking to me and my friend that were flying out there, and they were so kind. And they are like, we work on a show. And we were like, yeah, okay, you work on a show. <laughs> and then it turns out they all worked for Jimmy Kimmel. So we just became fast friends with them, and they were shooting in Austin that week, and they're like, hey, do you want to come and shoot with us we're doing some sketches and we were like yeah sure we're not doing anything these days so we'll come and shoot sketches so we ended up me and my girlfriend ended up shooting a couple sketches for them out in austin during south by and then you know came back to la didn't think anything about it and then they just kept calling me in for random stuff and then cousin sal ended up doing his kind of breakaway football show and i got into that and it was just that thing where you find people you're like yeah whatever you're doing i'm gonna do because you're so fun to be around that's how the whole jimmy kimmel crew is they're all amazing people that are really fun to be around and they're just an example of how good you can be at the top so anytime they asked me to be there i was like yeah no problem when and i think they're all friends too like for years and years and decades and stuff so that probably helped. Yeah, a lot of them are family. Like, he hires a lot of his family members. Like, Cousin Sal is actually his cousin. And so a lot of his family. And then, he, you know, there's an aspect of loyalty that I really love. So, yeah, they've all been around each other for so long. And there's just a camaraderie. And it feels like your family, like you're stepping into a family. And I just always loved that. It was just a great environment. And silly. You're just being silly. You're doing sketches and... You know, they give you creative freedom, and you just act ridiculous, and it's great. Nice. What the heck is Wacko Smacko? That was a project I did for a girl I met through another friend. She just called me in to do this series that she was writing. I did just one episode on that. And again, that was a, I think that was through the improv community as well. I think she was an improv, she's an improv girl, the person that wrote that. Gotcha. And directed that. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it, no problem. Were you in a movie called The Rocker? I was. That was so early on in my L.A. days. That was so early on. I got hired as a tiny role. I was playing, and now I feel terrible because I forget the me. Geiger, I think is his last name. I was playing his date to this party. We were making um, the main girl jealous. And that, I was so tiny. I look back at that footage. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I was so young. I was probably... It was probably like the first year I moved to L.A. or something. Oh, wow. Within the first year I did that, yeah. And that was something else I got on my own. A lot of the work that I did, I got on my own through hustling. Now, if you get something on your own, do you have to pay your manager and or agent on those projects? If they're within the region, it really depends on the relationship with, you know, you should if you're covered like if you're in the Southeast region and you have Southeast reps and, and you book you know, a TV show on your own, it's good to go through your agent. I mean, that shows loyalty. I think loyalty is so missing just in our society in general. So I like to always go through the agent. And a lot of times the agent can negotiate a higher rate for you or can just make sure everything is copacetic on set and the contract is, you know, that's why you have an agent. So it just really depends on the agent, the relationship that you have with the agent, but I always advocate for honesty and and that creates relationship that shows like, hey, I got this on my own, but I'm loyal to you and I want to make you money because I see that you work for me. Because a good agent obviously never takes money up front. They only take money when you, when you book. So you want to show that you're willing to be that kind of, you know, that kind of person and that's the kind of integrity I want to run my career with that makes sense that way they'll push harder for you they'll be in your corner more that makes total sense right it gives everybody a sense of security it's like look i know you're working for me here's something i booked on my own but whatever there's your cut you know there's there's no they don't have to worry it's like i would worry less if i were an agent and a, and a client did that i'll be like okay this is someone i can just trust like it's it's you know build trust i think Anything that does that in any relationship 
in in my life I, w- I want to do. Yeah, a, a sign that you know we're we're in this together. Yeah, because we ultimately are. I can't get into the doors without a great agent. I can't get a good contract without a great agent, and I want to cultivate those relationships and show my appreciation as often as I can. Absolutely. When I was younger, I'm older than you by a few years, but when I was, um, let's say, middle and or high school, uh, my favorite movie was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That's <laughs> like my brother's favorite movie. <laughs> I want to know what it was like to work with the great Alan Ruck. Oh, yes, that was so fun. He's uh, just incredibly peaceful and incredibly kind. And he was playing my dad, so I was already emotionally attached to him before I even went in. You know, doing the homework on the script, you already get emotionally attached to the person and he was playing my uh, dad in that project and he's just so kind he was so just conversational and asked a lot of questions and was game for anything just the kindest I mean I always thought I in my experience the people I've worked with that are really successful like that this is this kindness that has been such a model for me of how I want to shape you know, myself and my career. But yeah, he was just amazing. Amazing, amazing. Now, the project that we're talking about, folks, is a horror short film called Deathly. It was directed by Mike Williamson. Where could we find and see Deathly? I should have that reference. There is probably a link on my IMDb. I think Deathly is up on my IMDb account right now. And I think if you just search Deathly, there will be um, the YouTube that would come up for it, because I think they did uh, finally release it after it went through um, a bunch of film festivals. It did well in the festival circuit, and then they just released it to the public. Oh, cool. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, currently you are on NCIS New Orleans. Is that why you're in New Orleans right now? That's correct. And you, you're you playing, I guess, um, Scott Bakula's assistant, right? Right. He goes to a new office and uh, gets a new assistant, and that's me. Uh, my character's name is Jenny Young, and that's been a very fun... We're getting into way more fun material later in the month, but yeah, it's, it's amazing to work with him. He is another one of those incredible artists, incredible people, all all the way around, just incredible. But it's been such a wild ride, and I actually, for that role went in for like a one or two line co-star and they ended up giving me Jenny to read cold as a cold reading and uh, I ended up booking it. So that was a really fun, this again, that's why I love being in the room with the creators because they just want to play and see how you tell a story. I am going to correct you. You said that uh, you went in to read for whatever and then they gave you an opportunity to read for Jenny. I'm going to say you earned an opportunity to read for Jenny. (laughs) Okay. I love that. I love that. That's um, and that's a way better way to put it. Uh, I'll take that anytime. Well, I mean, but I guess it's a it's a testament to there's no small goals. So if you take every role as like that, I still am getting to tell a human story. You know, it will result in good things. Absolutely. Uh, you have like the greatest outlook ever. Thank you. You're welcome. Tell me about psychopaths. Oh, that's uh, Mickey Keating is the director for that. So he was actually an actor in Deathly with me. And amazing. He's done so well in, like, the horror market. His movies always open. They always go to Tribeca, and they always do so well. He's been, um, he's become very well known as a horror director now. And I've been lucky enough that when he goes and does a project, I usually hear from him to go step in. And that was really fun because I got to play just this wild girl. And they kept it really under wraps. So I didn't know much of what I was doing until I showed up on the day. I'm like, okay, <laughs> which I love. It's that, again, it's the, the play attitude. You show up to just play. But I went in and, and shot with them and, Mickey's incredible to work with. He's such an easy director. He's very, you know, quiet and unobtrusive, but a great director. And that was really, really fun because I got to play something that I had not really explored, which was this party drug addict kind of girl. 
so it was really fun. Sweet. You got to be a party girl. But yeah. <laughs> I believe you wrote and produced and starred in a dramatic short called Pretext. And that has a very, very, I guess, serious subject. Can you talk about that? Yeah, of course. That was uh, with a really good friend, Jeremy Raiden. We wrote that together. That kind of came about over just talking about things we want to change in the world, because I think that's the cool thing about telling stories, is that you get to um, present ideas that you want changed. And so we were talking a lot about like the process of what a woman goes through, or man, woman or man, anyone, child, that goes through after uh, they are raped and going into the system and, and what it's like to report it and uh, talk to detectives and, and pretext calls and how people a lot of times don't know what a pretext call is. And we wanted to kind of just shine some light on this part of the system that doesn't seem to be working, at least in our opinion, but does have that sort of adverse effect on victims. And uh, a pretext call is essentially when a victim is brought in and asked to call the person that assaulted them or allegedly assaulted them. And they have to, um, you know, they're in the room with a detective and they have to sort of say what the detective tells them to do. And usually it's uh, acting like they are happy with what happened. And it's, it's just traumatizing. And usually that those tapes are not admissible in court. So we would just, wanted to just kind of shine a light on like, hey, this is a thing that's happening and we're not detectives, so we can't really talk to that end of it. But we can talk to victims and say that I don't know that it's that effective. So we just wanted to shine a light on that. And it was a great learning experience to be that involved with making something, you know, producing and, and writing and all the different facets of, of filmmaking. Did that experience make you want to write and produce more? Uh, I have been writing ever since. I actually just finished the pilot yesterday. I think writing and directing is, is the direction that I would gonna want to go. And being in the editing room, I find that you lose a lot in editing if the editing doesn't go right. And so that's something with my next project that I do. I want to be through the, you know, go through the editing process with them. So I learned so much from making that. But yeah, I think I will always, I'm always going to write because it's another way. I become a better actor when I write and it's another way to, um, you know, get characters out on a page. That sounds awesome. Did you find it difficult when you started, you know, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be cro Magnon and say putting pen to paper, but when you, when you first started, you know, pounding on the keyboard, was it difficult? Did you struggle? I think the the limiting beliefs are difficult. The beliefs of like, why do I think I can do this? It, you know, is this going to result in anything? I think we're such a result oriented society that it's like, well, what's it going to, what's it going to do? Like, where's it going to go? And I think when you come from that place, that part of my brain would make me halt. I'd be like, well, what's the point? This is not going to go anywhere. I definitely would go through that when I think about end result too much. Or what do I think I'm doing? I didn't go to some fancy, fancy college to learn how to write fancy, fancy things. But I think that that's, you know, like what they say, a limiting mindset. And then it, when I just sit down and I'm like, okay, I know these characters. I know the characters that I want to bring to life just tell their story, and then it will just kind of pour out of me, as long as I know the people. And I love writing about people. One of the things that I am most fascinated by when I'm talking to people such as yourself, you touched on it earlier, is what made you think you could dot, dot, dot. And so mm -hmm. I really appreciate that, that long explanation of why you think you can dot, dot, dot. I think that you have been very successful at it. I wish you continued success. Before we go, though, I do have a couple more things, so I'll try to make them quick. I know I've taken up a lot of your time already. What the hell is Cracker Jackson? Oh, man. Those are the All Deaf Digital guys. I know these guys, Ian and Moo, that write for All Deaf Digital Media. And I've done a ton of um, online contact, content with them. All of it's been this satirical, ridiculous comedy. But it's just amazing guys doing the most ridiculous things. And that was this kind of space age guy that I played this, like, scientists in it but it was just hilarious they're another group of people i get on set with them and all we do is laugh like 
half of it's outtake because we're just laughing so much. So I've done a lot of them, and a lot of that's not up on IMDb, but a lot of stuff through all that digital in the online world. One, that's one of those. But those guys are, I, I will always adore them. They always make me laugh. So Cracker Jackson, I believe, is available on YouTube. I watched a couple of episodes, and I think that my favorite line, so everybody, Cracker Jackson is a superhero, more of a superhero, and in this particular episode, he saves this this girl in an alley from, I don't know, a bad guy or something, and she says, thank you, Cracker Jackson, for saving me, and he says with a serious face, no problem, bitch. It's my duty to protect that booty. Yep. I could not that's stop laughing. Guys. I could not stop laughing. Uh, All right. That's what I'm saying. You get a, you get around them. They're so funny. So funny. That is hilarious. What the heck is mythic storytelling from around the world? Just on my own, I read a lot of uh, Joseph Campbell, Carl Jung, studying myths, because I think that's, you know, the birth of story. So if we understand the myths in each culture, then when we go to um, a script, we can kind of learn for, learn about th- those themes that exist and have existed for a long time. You know, all storytelling kind of comes from myths. So it gives me just, you know, it gives me sort of an interconnectedness. So, you know, when you study all the world's myths, you get more connected to other cultures and kind of understand them a little bit more. And it gets more connected to when you go into a script, like understanding archetypes and all of these things that just in- inform that aspect of the story. Nice. And as we're winding down, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that I didn't bring up that you wanted to talk about? I don't think so. You asked really amazing questions. So I really appreciate all of that and you looking at all that material. I really, I love that. So thank you. Looking at what material? No, that was all off the top of my head. Oh, well, that was great. (laughs) Thanks. I'm awesome. Good job. Christina Elizabeth Smith, will you tell everybody where we can find you on the various social media platforms? Absolutely. I mean, I mostly use Instagram. Let's not even lie. So my Instagram handle is just Christina Elizabeth Smith. That's where I primarily post everything. I have a Twitter that I'm almost never on, which is bad. That handle is at I underscore am underscore CES. And those are the main ones that I use. I only use a couple. I can't maintain any more than that. But, yeah, I say follow on Instagram. That's where I'm going to post all my fun stuff. I'll post stuff from being on set with NCIS and just my random dog posts <laughs> of my two idiot dogs. So that's where you can find me. Sweet. I would just like to point out that your Twitter handle is the worst Twitter handle I've ever heard of. Oh, terrible. But it's because I'm never on Twitter. I've been in, on Twitter like five times in the last like six years. I just you know, I just I get overwhelmed because there's so much stuff coming in. I'm like I can't read all this stuff coming in, so I'm terrible at Twitter. So just go to Instagram, and that's where you're going to find all the stuff you want to see anyway. Sweet. There you go. Well, Christina, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today on Fascination Street. I'm so glad that I got to talk to you and and virtually meet you. You are a delight and a treasure. Thank you so much. It was really fun. Really great questions. I appreciate it. You're welcome, and thank you back. Now, stop talking to me on the phone and go enjoy New Orleans. <laughs> okay, and the hot weather. I will go do that. You go enjoy your cold weather. Oh, my gosh. I can't do it. It's freezing. Enjoy New Orleans. Yeah, go... Have beignets. <laughs> have, go, go over to the, uh, I guess it's the, uh, I think it's called, oh, man, I can't remember what it's called. But go Oh, it's called like the original grocery store or something like that. Original grocery. Oh. Anyway, it's it's not it's like two blocks away from Cafe Du Mont and go have a muffaletta. Oh, yeah. oh muffaletta. Go do it. Okay, I'll do all the things. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Bye, Christina. Bye. Hey guys, this is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else, but nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. 
From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be. An Academy Award winning actor, a platinum selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find Fascination Street Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street. Thank you.